Hi, everybody. Thank you for staying this long. Um, it's nice to see everyone here today. So how many people are here who live in San Diego? Raise your hands. So this is nothing new to you. <laughs> this is about 170 steps from my front door. And I have a lot of friends on the East Coast who hate me every time I post this on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but I moved to San Diego about 17 years ago. And I was a national instructor for a very large computer retail chain. And three days after I got here, they laid me off. Now, they're obviously not human beings with hearts that function because they had known for six weeks that I was moving from New Jersey to San Diego. And they laid 50 of us off of 75 instructors. And they didn't say, hey, you might want to hold off. You might not want to move 3,000 miles. So I got laid off three days after I got here. And I had $600 in my bank account. And I had rent due in two weeks. So I did what most 20-somethings do. I called my parents crying and freaking out. And my father, thinking he was being helpful, said, Kara, the worst that could happen is you move back to New Jersey and move in with us for a while. <laughs> yeah, Dad, you're exactly right. That is the worst that could happen. So I gave myself two days to freak out a little and go through the motions, and I opened up the Yellow Pages. And I looked in publications, called McGraw-Hill, called a couple others in town. I'd been an English major. So I figured, oh, I can go be a copy editor or a writer or something. Nobody's hiring. So I turned the page. And next, in alphabetical order, was public relations. And the first place I called said, we just decided today to hire a senior PR manager. Why don't you come in for an interview? Went in, it was great. Loved it. They said, why are you qualified to do the job? I said, I'm from New Jersey. I can talk a dog off a chuck wagon. Plus, I was an English major. I am fully qualified to do this job. I was not qualified at all to do this job. But the next day, I got the call, and they gave it to me. So here's the thing to remember about moving 3,000 miles and getting laid off three days later. I had a choice to make. I could have crawled up into a corner and died and moved back home into my parents' basement. Johnny's son is a comic and an MIT PhD student. And he does this account where, yes, there are spelling errors to the content strategists, and the copy editors, and the audience. That's his shtick. That's his thing. So in that moment, I had a choice. Look, life is bad. Everyone's sad. We're all going to die. But I already bought this inflatable bouncy castle, so are you going to take off your shoes or what? And in that moment, I decided to take off my shoes and I've been here for 17 years. And that was one of the first of many reinventions throughout my career. So I went from being a national instructor at a computer chain, technically working in tech, to being a senior PR manager for a high-tech public relations firm. Now, the thing about working in design, the thing about working in UX, is really, as a society, it goes beyond all that. Right? Think about how often we are siloed or we're being forced to pigeonhole ourselves. Pick a major, pick a city, buy a house, pick a career. And when we start doing these things, we think these are the things we have to do. And I'm here to tell you the path you're on is not the path you have to stay on. And so today I'm going to share a lot of stories about what does that look like and how do you move from entertainment to sports to government back in and out of tech multiple times. Um, and the answer is there's three lessons. And there's three, you know, being a good UXer, um, I've kind of identified three patterns that I kept doing over and over my career. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to share those stories today. Yeah, All right, cool. All right, so the first thing you need to know about me is that my life is a series of moments where I'm sneaking up to the big kids' table, trying not to be noticed. So I love being in the background. I love being the person who's organizing things, who's making things happen, and then other people get on stage and shine. So today is not my normal MO. Usually I'm the Scots and the Jonathans and the production crew of the world. I'm in the back making sure everything happens so that the people up here can shine. Um, and that's something I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is my grandfather. This is me sassing him per the usual. Um, don't be wicked jealous of my pants. I know they are just, they're pretty awesome. And so I've been at a lot 
of big kids' tables through my career. And I used to say the hashtag Dave Matthews Band, so damn lucky, uh, because I thought I was very lucky to have gotten to each of these places. And about four years ago, one of my friends sat me down and he said, you have to stop saying you're lucky. Because every time you say you're lucky, you're telling a young kid or a man or a woman that no matter how hard they work, they will never be able to achieve what you've achieved. And that rocked my world. So I don't say I'm lucky anymore. There's a bit of luck, but there's also when you're presented with opportunity, you have to stand up and say yes to it, right? So I say I'm fortunate. You know, being in the first class of Presidential Innovation Fellows five years ago, that, that movement of bringing technology and human-centered design into the federal government, and then working at TurboTax, I know I have a lot of former coworkers in the room, um, working at TEDx and then the Oscars and the Super Bowl, those are all things where I stood up and said yes. Yeah. So my first lesson is about that. So how did a kid from Jersey with a bachelor's degree in English and theater, of all things, end up in each of those places? I want to clarify something. This is not New Jersey. <laughs> and I know when most of you hear New Jersey, you either think of Newark Airport or you think of this TV show. Spoiler alert, none of these people are from New Jersey. I just want you to know that. Get that out of there. The reason I was able to go to each of those places and do that work is that because of her, it never occurred to me that I couldn't do or be anything I set my mind to. And that's me, very small me. Because um, some people see this and they're like, oh, you had brown hair. No, that's my mom. Um, <laughs> so the three lessons, oh, that my mom has brown hair or that I was little at one point? <laughs> you acknowledge your mother that way. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, it's true, it is true. So you've heard me say yes a couple times already. Those are the three lessons I'm gonna go over today. Always say yes, connecting the dots, and making your own opportunities. Those are the three things that got me to all those places. So let's dive in. Always say yes. What does that mean? Does it mean that if somebody asks you to perform open heart surgery, you're going to do it? There's a little participatory, so when I throw questions out, you should probably answer me. <laughs> no, we're not gonna do open heart surgery. Um, the way this shows up in my career is I'm a strong believer in giving back to my community. I'm a strong believer in raising my hand when opportunities come up. So back in 1999, we had the Women's World Cup, and it was the first time it was in the United States. If, if you've known me for more than five minutes, you actually wouldn't know that I spent 20 years in the soccer community playing. I, I played, and then I coached, and I did refs, and I ran a league, actually ran La Jolla Soccer League for a while, and I coached La Jolla Nomads. So soccer was my life in a very big way. So when I found out that we were getting Women's World Cup in 99, I raised my hand, and I said, I'll do whatever you need. I don't care. Um, and I volunteered with my coach from when I was a kid, and we um, were placed on the press operations team together. So growing up in New Jersey, we were at Giant Stadium, you know, middle of the summer, 1999, and we get to see the women's team march onto the field. My heroes, the Mia Hams, the Julie Foudies, the Joy Fawcett's, and it was great. And a couple weeks later, I actually moved out to San Diego. And you've got to remember, right now, soccer's not really a big thing in the States, even the men's league. Mm. And don't get me into the whole gender pay gap between the U.S. men's team and the U.S or the US women's team, the US men's team. I have a friend who posted on Facebook a couple weeks ago when the men's team was knocked out of the World Cup that you know the US isn't a soccer superpower and we need to put more money behind it. And I responded, three World Cup titles, four gold medals. The US soccer is a world superpower. You're just talking about the men's team. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I called the head of press operations. I said, Jim, I just happened to move to San Diego. The women at the time were tracking towards hitting the final at the Rose Bowl. I said, I think you need me. He said, I think I do. So I was actually in the press box at the Rose Bowl when Brandy Chastain hit the winning penalty kick against China, July 10th, 1999, and the world erupted. And she took her show off. And I you know, include this shot because it's so iconic of joy and dedication to craft. And I think so much of what we bring to our craft as designers and UXers is joy and dedication because it's not about us. It's not about our egos. It's about the people we're there to advocate for. So what happened after that was um, the WSA, Women's United Soccer Association, was started. We got a team in San Diego. And because I was coaching La Jolla Nomads, that was their practice field up on, uh, in La Jolla. And I got to know a lot of the team, a lot of the players and I found out they had an opening for a receptionist. Shh. 
sure, cool, yeah, I, I, I will be your receptionist, I don't care. Like, I just wanna work, because I'm so passionate about soccer, I'm so passionate about you know, introducing kids to the sport and to these women. So I started as the receptionist. Now, six weeks later, they were like, oh wait, you, you know San Diego, you know the community, you kinda have your shit together, we're gonna make you community relations manager. So starting off as the receptionist, not thinking I was too big or too good to do something. And that's a lesson I want to impart too. You're, you're not above making photocopies. You're not about give, above getting coffee. You're not above making wireframes when you want to be doing you know, video design or something. Um, be humble enough to do those entry level jobs if you love something. So I went from receptionist to community relations manager. And during that period, we got the Super Bowl in San Diego. So I raised my hand again, volunteer opportunity, uh, raised my hand, and I said, what do you need me to do? I'll do anything. And they said, well, you worked on the, the Women's World Cup, uh, on the press operations team. Can you run the media center for the Super Bowl? Yes. Yes, I can. I knew I'd figure it out. Uh, <clears throat> fast forward three weeks, and uh, government came in, and they were doing the, you know, the, the, the sweeps and making sure everything was secure. And they were like, we really don't want a civilian running the media center. So I was out of a job. Um, and by job, I mean volunteer gig. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I was bummed, but you know, what are you gonna do? It was, it was a cool opportunity. Two weeks later, they came back and said, you know, we need somebody to be the production coordinator for the halftime show. Can you do that? What do you think I said? <laughs> yes. Okay. Was I qualified? Eh, maybe. Not, no, not really. So I had a team of 80 people, and our job was to get, this is gonna like pull back the wizard's curtain for a second, um, get the 80 fans on and off, or sorry, we had 80 volunteers to get the 150 fans on and off the field for the halftime show. Now these fans, you can actually apply to be the fans. They, it's, it's a production company that comes in and they handpick people who they think will look good on camera. Um, and we had 90 seconds to get them on and off the field. And the production company from LA was really cool. And they're like, you know, Kara, we like your how. You're organized, you get stuff done. Have you ever thought about working in entertainment? I said, funny you should ask. I'm moving up in three weeks because I had this thing where I didn't want to be 30 and not have tried entertainment. And they said, oh, cool, do you want to work on our next gig with us? Because the way Hollywood works is once you're in with a crew, you go from show to show to show with them. Yeah, sure, you know, cool. So we're sitting here outside Qualcomm Stadium, and they hand me a phone, and I interview on the spot right before our final tech rehearsal for the halftime show. And uh, the reason this picture's up here is that was the year. It was no, about, no doubt with Sting and Shania Twain. And so, you know, they're rocking in there. I'm on the phone doing an interview, and, and at the end of the call, the woman says, yeah, you got the job. You start February 13th. Okay, so I hand the phone back to Marge, and I said, I'm in, but she never said what the gig was. <laughs> my, my first job in Hollywood was the Oscars. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whose life is this? Uh, so I went up, and, and this was the year uh, Gil Cates, the producer, decided to bring every living best actor and actress person back on the stage for a reunion, and that was my job on that show. I did post-production leading up to the show, and then at the show, uh, I was the cat herder for very, I would say, important people, but you can put another adjective in there um, for a lot of people. We'll just say for a lot of people. And it was a great experience. You know, it... it made me realize I like working at scale. I like working at a very large scale. Uh, so fast forward a couple years, worked in tech, and five years ago, in May of 2012, the US Chief Technology Officer at the time, Todd Park at the White House, sent out a tweet saying they were looking for a few good women and men to serve their country. And speaking of women, um, how many people have the design forward pin? Yeah, yep, so if you turn it to its side, it's Wonder Woman. So. Thanks for that hack there. Um, and so I answered the call, and there were 786 of us who applied to serve our country for six months to come in and apply lean and human-centered design and tech to the biggest challenges facing government and the people. And my team in particular, we were charged with reimagining the relationship between the government and the people from a technology perspective, which if you're a designer, like that is a big, meaty problem. And the great part is they didn't get into our how, they just gave us the what, which is so exciting. I mean, how many times, and I don't need a show of hands because I don't want to out anybody, but how many times are you given the product to deliver? Or you're told, it's kind of like we talk about being short order cooks, right? Um, but we weren't, we were just given the what and we were able to figure out the how. And so at the end of that, we were presenting our five projects to President Obama in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. And at the end of the presentation, they, they tell you where to sit and they had seated me next to him. He tapped my arm. And he said, hey, should we go into the Oval? 
and get a group picture before you all leave. What do you think I said? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and so this idea of always say yes has served me very well. And, and sometimes it's a volunteer opportunity and sometimes it's a paid gig. And both are very important. And, you know, I didn't do the volunteer gigs to get the paid ones. I did the things that I was passionate about, and that led me to each of these places. So let's talk a second about connecting the dots. Sometimes, and this has happened multiple times in my career, it's not that I am flighty, I just get bored easily, so that's why I, I jump from you know, entertainment to sports to government to tech. Um, but sometimes the thing you want to do may not be as easily apparent to the person you're trying to sell it on. So, for example, um, when I was an instructional designer, I found out that there was this team within training and development called New Media, and they were doing their first e-learning course. And I said, oh, I just got out of Hollywood. I did a lot of script coverage, meaning like you review scripts and you summarize them and you say to your agent, like, yes, you should move forward this or no, you shouldn't. I said, I can help write the e-learning script if you'd like. And they were like, yes, who are you, you magic unicorn? Please help us. And I said, well, what else does your team do? And they said, oh, well, you know, we take products that the company is creating and we put them in front of people who will use the product and they will give us feedback and we make changes with the engineers. And I was like, whoa, what's that called? And they're like, it's usability. I was like, wait, so you get to be the voice of the user in the meetings and you get to advocate for them? So I ran to my boss's office and I said, Bill, I want to change my job description and I want 25% of my time to be new media and 75% to be instructional design. Because that was most of my career before tech was instructional design. And he's like, Sure, as long as you get your day job done, I don't care what you do. I was like, okay, cool. So that was how I got into UX, was just walking into my boss's office and saying, can we do this? And he said yes. And so every instructional design I, job I had the next few years, I always like, started putting UX into it until it got to the point where my first full-time UX job was at TurboTax as a senior content strategist working on TurboTax.com. Um, but a lot of that is, is, is just having the courage to, to stand up and say, this is what I want. How can we get to yes? Right? Um, and I'll that again, a lot of that is your how, how you approach it, how you say things. So um, this is what, you know, when people say to me, I'm at an impasse and I want to move up into leadership, or I'm thinking about changing careers, what should I do? This is an exercise I came up with for people to do. And, and if you have a pen and paper, let's do it quickly now. If not, go home and do it. Um, you know, when I say, what are you good at? So you make two columns. On the left is what you're good at. On the right is what you're passionate about. So good at is like, what are you known for? What are you the go-to person for? If you weren't on your team, what would be missing? What you're passionate about is what drives you or your happy spot. And then this little spot down bottom, like you gotta give a little credence to what you hate. Like what do you, what do you just hate doing? And it doesn't make you a bad person, it's just what you don't prefer to do. Because um, a lot of times people will come to you because they know you're really good at something. But what if you're not passionate about it anymore? What if you don't like it anymore? Um, I had a bottle of water there. Okay. Um, you know, what if you don't like it anymore? And you don't want to be the person that people keep coming to you for something because you're good at it if you don't enjoy it. So this exercise is a good opportunity to figure out what you're good at, what you're passionate about. And then as you're thinking about that next step in your career, this gives you kind of a roadmap for what you should be looking for. Now you're going to notice it's not about titles. It's not even about really jobs, this is more about your areas of interest. So I'll give you a little example. So I know that I'm good at writing, editing, end-to-end -end strategy. Um, people tell me I'm good at giving advice. I seem to get a lot of emotional labor going on there, um, but I do enjoy it. UX, and then creating safe spaces for people to do um, the best work of their career. And that's something that, that I'm really, um, it's in my heart to do that. What I'm passionate about though, is experience design, especially shows and live events. Um, building the first draft of a show rundown, I am telling you, the biggest smile on my face, and that's, that's when the show rundown is the minute by minute cue to cue call for everything that happens. Like this show has a rundown, like Kara goes on stage at 3.05, and at 3.10 this happens at 3.20. And so that's down to the second, um, and, and I love that. I also am really passionate about solving hard, big, meaty problems. Right? So working at the federal level, working at a place like Qualcomm or Intuit, where you have a global audience of thousands of people and millions of users. I really love working on shit that really matters. 
And your mileage may vary on that one. For me, it's giving back to my community. I do a lot of pro bono work in the digital strategy space and the experience design space. And then what I hate, I hate. If you want to see me wither and die, tell me that I need to schedule a meeting and find a time that works for 30 different participants. Like, I will pay somebody to do that for me, or I'll buy you coffee. Um, I'm not as allergic to attending them, but yeah, that, that whole, like, that part of arranging is not my jam. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to do what are you good at, and what are you passionate about, and then give one or two little I hates. Because at the end of the day, I'd rather work with somebody and hire somebody who's 5 out of 10 good at something, but 9 out of 10 passionate about it. Right? Because I can you know, teach them what they need to know, bring them up. But if you gave me somebody that's 10 out of 10 good about at something, but only 3 out of 10 passionate, how is that going to affect team dynamics? And how much will they actually enjoy doing their work and give their best? So you've created both columns. You put your little hate corner down there. Now you look for patterns across both. So it could be patterns within the columns. It could be patterns across the columns. So for me, there's a pattern that emerges around communications, writing and editing, puzzles. Puzzles is big, not literally the ones you do, but puzzles I need to figure out. And then the last one is humans, like working on the humans, uh, creating experiences that are great for them, creating spaces that are safe for them. That is what makes me so darn happy uh, and why I think UX is a good fit for me. Um, the star in the heart, you know, the, that I told you that building that first rundown draft of uh, for a show is just, you know, it's taking somebody else's vision and putting it into execution mode and action. That's just, oh, I love it. Um, yes, I'm a dork. Uh, and experience design, like that's my heart. Like that is that is what I was put on earth to do. Whether it's as a receptionist at a pro sports team or, or working at the White House, that's that's what I am here to do. Um, and to help others, that's, that's, that's my sweet spot. So do this, and, and especially if you're thinking about you know, switching careers or you wanna move up to leadership, you've gotta figure out yourself before you can figure out what's next. So take the time, I highly encourage you to not do this like on a computer, don't type it out, like there's a power, like my, my master's is in instructional design, so a lot of adult learning psychology, the power of putting the pen to paper or drawing it and thinking about it and letting it sink in. So do this critical self-reflection, look for the patterns, and then when you're looking for that next thing, whether it's a move up or a move lateral, read between the lines in the job descriptions. There's so much that you can feel better about if you let go of titles and levels and look for jobs that fulfill you and fulfill your heart, fulfill your mind. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, I wanted to take you in a career path to find a new life experience design. And okay. I was wondering where like, yeah, that's what I want to do. So the question was, how long did it take me in my career path to figure out I like experience design? And the second part was? Was there a defining moment? Was there a defining moment? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes, I have an answer. I wish we had a song queued up, because there's a song involved. Um, <laughs> I knew early on, so I was, again, you heard me, I was supposed to be a high school English teacher. Um, I knew early on that I liked people, that I liked teaching them, and it wasn't, the reason I didn't go to high school English was because I didn't like the paperwork. I figured out my first semester of student teaching, I hated the paperwork, but I loved pulling the aha moments out of the students. So everything that I've done as you look through the career, there's always been that human connection element, so I knew I was on the right path. The moment I knew that experience design, and no one's ever asked me that question, thank you. The moment I knew experience design was for me was when I was community relations manager for the Spirit. And it's opening day, my first opening day. I'm standing on a bright green pitch at USD's Torero Stadium. There's thousands of people going down the hill waiting to get in, waiting for gates to open. The sky's blue, the field is pristine, the stands are empty, and I'm part of my job as community relations manager was I was in charge of the mascot, the giveaways, and the national anthem singer. So I'm standing there with the national anthem singer, and the house music kicks on, which indicates the gates are about to open, and U2's beautiful day comes on. And it was. Perfect day, perfect people, great cause, and there I was. And that was the first time in my career that I knew exactly what I was supposed to be doing. And I'll never forget that. And I actually got to see U2 at Qualcomm Stadium a couple weeks ago, and that song came on, and I just <laughs> My friends with me is like, are you OK? I'm like, no, I'll tell you the story on the way home on the trolley. We're good. It's just, you know, it's, we're all good. It's, we're actually all very, very good. So what's next? So make your own opportunities. Um, this one is going to take a little courage. This one isn't as easy. Um, and this one took a lot of me stumbling and failing 
and getting back up and trying again. So TEDx San Diego, how many people have ever heard of that? Show of hands. Yeah. I don't know if Mark's still in here, the executive producer. He left, OK. Um, so I had been watching TED Talks for years. And I heard we were getting our own TED in San Diego. So TEDx started in 2009. It was an offshoot, offshoot of the TED program. And TED wanted to let anybody put on a show. And so they came up with these brand guidelines and some rules. And I went to the website, and I saw the volunteer link. So I'm sure you all know what happened next. I clicked on it. And I said to the person who I didn't know on the other side of the form, I don't care. I will be your janitor. I just want to be involved. And by the way, I worked on the Oscars and Emmys, if you think that'll help. And <laughs> five minutes later, I got a call from Jack Abbott. And he said, we don't have a director yet. And the show's 10 weeks away. Will you direct our show? What do you think I said? Yes. And that was the first time I knew I was completely qualified to do it. So I came in, I created the show Rundown. We had a fantastic first year. We had Marty Cooper, who invented the cell phone. We had Jake Wood from Team Rubicon. And we created this movement. I think we just had our eighth one, seventh or eighth, um, a couple Saturdays ago in San Diego. And to be part of that founding team was such a special memory and treat, because we were all going in together, totally new and totally green. But we created this magical moment in time for that day. And I was so inspired. I was walking on air for three or four days after the event, after I slept probably 14 hours. And I was so excited, I brought it to Intuit. And I applied, I got my own license, I produced it for six years at Intuit. But the point there is, in both instances, I made my own opportunity. Now, at Intuit, I had to go to the senior vice president of TurboTax, I had to have a, a plan, I had to have a vision, I had to tie, so what I did was I tied everything back to the corporate leadership pillars. And at Intuit, there's a thing called 10% time. So I decided to use my 10% time, which you can work on anything you want, to create this and give this gift to my coworkers. So in the make your own opportunities vein, what are things that you can do at work? What are opportunities that you can lead a project? Maybe it's out of your subject area expertise. And it doesn't just have to be at work either, right? So think about the things you can do at work. Is it leading a group? Let's say you have a community of practice for editors or engineers, and you have them meet once a month, and you're the organizer. That's a leadership opportunity. Leadership is not a title. It's a mindset. So how can you show up? Maybe it's you know, going into the community, into your local school once a month, and teaching kids how to code. That is leadership. But you've got to look for those opportunities. And if they don't exist, make them. But know what you're making. What is your vision? How are you going to execute? What does success look like? I had all of that for TEDx into it. And at the end, our NPS, our Net Promoter Score, for our first event was 96. Why did I choose Net Promoter Score as my measure of success? Because that's the language at Intuit. Intuit talks with other products in Net Promoter Score. So when you're pitching, when you're creating, make sure you're speaking, and we've heard this a couple times today, speak in the language of either the people who are the approvers or the organizers, the people who can say yes to you. And never take a no from somebody who's not qualified to give you a yes. By the way, these are my two favorite TED Talks, and you should all watch them. Doesn't have to be tonight. You've got time. Um, Brian Stevenson's We Need to Talk About an Injustice from a Storytelling Perspective. This is the best storytelling I've ever seen on a stage. This one, the LXD, this is a great example of taking a hack and it's a dance, and it's amazing, and it's beautiful. And the things they do with their body are things that we just, I'm like, I didn't, I didn't know that was possible. I mean, my body can't do it, but somebody, God bless them, they can. Um, so that, that's, that's the point of Make Your Own Opportunity, is look for opportunities, and if they're not there, create them, and give yourself that forward momentum, because just sitting there and waiting for it to come to you, spoiler alert, it's not going to happen. So let's talk about this for a second. This is the what and the how. So the what is the results you achieve, right? You hit your quarterly goals. You hit your sales for the year. You got a net promoter score of 100. Cool, congratulations. If everybody who is on the team with you will never work with you again because you are a jerk to all of them, what good does that do any of us? That's your how. So as you think through these things, as you work with people, Think about the what, think about how you get there. Because if you burn everybody on the road to success or the road to completion, it doesn't matter. You don't want to be, I mean, who knows? I shouldn't take your agency from you. Maybe you do want to be the person that gets the results at any cost. Cool, I'm never going to work with you. I'd rather create an inclusive environment where people feel heard, where everyone feels like their idea is valued, 
And it doesn't become about whether or not I succeed, it's whether or not we succeed. <laughs> obligatory Game of Thrones reference. Um, and over the years, you know, it's interesting. I, I remember telling Dan Maurer after my second TEDx into it, I was moving into a new role, and I said, Dan, I don't know if I'm, I'm a leader. Like, I'm going to have a team for the first time, like an official team, right? Like, we have to do, like, performance reviews and stuff. He looked at me. He's like, Kara, how many people did you have on TEDx into it last year? And I said, 26. I mean, I fully built out a team with verticals. We had a talent relations team, a communications team, production team, and experience design team. And um, he said, did any of those report to you in the traditional sense? I said, no. He goes, did you lead the team to success? I said, yes. So that was an aha moment. So over the years, I've, I've kind of paid attention to the patterns that have emerged in my leadership style. And it boils down to these four things. Empower the team, rally around the cause, be humble, and give away the glory. And I have a whole talk on these, but I wanted to include them because Scott asked specifically two things today. What's important to you and who, which designer has um, inspired you? And, and this is important to me, making sure that the team can execute on what they were brought in to do. And, and you know, it's all about leading through influence, not authority. So even if a team doesn't report to you, let's say you're leading a tiger team or you're leading a project or you're leading a redesign of something you are still leading that team. Whether or not you get to tell them what their bonus is at the end of the year, you are a leader, and that is a big responsibility. So empowering the team means you set up a vision and you trust them to execute what they came to do, because they're pretty damn good at what they do or they wouldn't be there, right? So empower the team. Work with them, set up the plan. What I usually do is I'll, I'll create the vision and I'll say to the team, like, how are you going to execute your part? We work together, we go back and forth, and once we're aligned, they're off and running. And we'll check in once a week, but I trust that they can do what they said they were going to do. Second is rally around the cause, and that's having a good vision um, around what are we going after? What does success look like? Um, being humble, this is about knowing as a leader what you don't know. So build that tribe around you. Know your deficiencies. Like, I know that you don't want to put me in charge of, let's say, uh, marketing, for example. I'm okay at it, but I'm not good or great at it. So I'll make sure that when you know, I'm leading something, I'll have a marketing expert or somebody nearby. So like build that tribe and know where they belong. Um, and the last one's give away the glory. You don't have to be the one that does the interviews or does the presentations or goes on TV. Like spread that glory around and think about people who historically may not be given that chance. Like give them that chance to shine. Throw that shine on them. Um, you know, I have a friend, an al and he's an ally, and he'll say, when he gets an invite to speak at a conference, how many white dudes are on stage? Can I send you know, my female or you know, I've got somebody LGBT, like thinking about people who don't often get invited to things and passing on the invite to them. Um, so those are ways that you can give away the glory. So let's talk about the Cancer Moonshot for a second. So um, this was prior to my current job. This was the most recent thing I worked on. I was director of experience design for Vice President Biden at the White House on the Cancer Moonshot. And then for those of you who don't know what the Moonshot is, let's roll the tape and show them. Now, last year, Vice President Biden said that with a new Moonshot, America can cure cancer. Last month, he worked with this Congress to give scientists at the National Institutes of Health the strongest resources that they've had in over a decade. Well. So, so tonight I'm announcing a new national effort to get it done. And because he's gone to the mat for all of us on so many issues over the past 40 years, I'm putting Joe in charge of mission control. For the loved ones we've all lost, for the families that we can still save, let's make America the country that cures cancer once and for all. What do you say, Joe? Let's make it happen. So there was a team of nine of us that came together, and we had um, 11 months to sort this out. This was in January of 2016. And we quickly pivoted on the goal. We wanted to make 10 years of advance to the next five. So as director of experience design, we went on a two-month 
ethnography sprint, discovery sprint across the country, talking to over 200 doctors, nurses, patients, caregivers, sidekicks, advocacy groups, technology companies, because we, we focused in on one part of the moonshot, which is how do we increase the number of people who would consider a cancer clinical trial, because currently only four to 6% of cancer patients go into a trial. And if we want to cure it and get there faster and make it a more manageable disease, we have to get more people in trials, or at least have them consider trials. So after the discovery sprint, we came up with a hypothesis about where is the moment we can make the biggest impact on whether or not someone says yes or no to a clinical trial. And it's the oh shit moment. It's the, I'm sitting in my doctor's office and I was just told I have cancer. You have to remember, doctors have 15 minutes to prep to see a patient, 15 minutes to see a patient, and then you rinse and repeat. But we thought, you know, how are people doing this? How are people solving this? So this is the journey map we came up with. Um, a couple months later, we held a Cancer Moonshot Summit in DC. There was also 7,000 people around the country and the world. We had viewing parties in all 50 states, plus Guam, plus Puerto Rico. And people coming together to solve these big problems and help us with these challenges and crowdsource the wisdom because we had a lot of people, or we should say we have a lot of people in government who have PhDs in kicking cancer's ass. But we wanted everybody to have a say in it. So that was my job as director of experience design was everyone can be connected to the moonshot. And there's a couple of different ways we did it. We created a page on uh, serve.gov, so cancer.serve.gov. You can look for opportunities in your community to sign up for, you know, you can go to a hospital and there, there's people playing guitar. You can volunteer to walk around with that person and hold their guitar, guitar hold their guitar case um, or get them water. Uh, and it was a really cool opportunity, especially for me, because when I got off the phone with the VP's director of digital before I joined the team, she said, I need somebody from tech to help me figure this out. And, and I raised my hand and I said yes. And at the end of the call, I told her, I said, Lindsay, I'm in. And I wasn't born to do this work. I survived to do it because I'm a three-time cancer survivor. And uh, this is what design does. This is what good design does. This is life-changing. And it's not just about us. We can change millions of lives with good design. And so I wholeheartedly took that opportunity and the 11 months we had to dive in. Mind you, after the election, I gained 20 pounds and got really sick. And, but you know, we were all focused on our deadline. And so when you think about the work you do and you wonder if it's important, if you don't feel like it's important where you are, go find a place where it is important. Because life is entirely too short to not be doing the best work of your life, doing work you're passionate about and that you love. To answer Scott's second question, a designer's that impact on my design is my friend Amy K. Rosenthal. She is known for her yellow umbrella and the beckoning of lovely. And the way she thinks about creating experiences and creating moments is so inspirational. She, inspired me to think differently about my own experiential design work. She inspired me to love unabashedly and every day. And she also taught me to design to create joy and delight. Now you all know Amy as well. From her books, Duck Rabbit, from her book, Spoon, and from last spring when her New York Times article on finding a new wife for her husband because she was dying from ovarian cancer went viral, and she passed away. And this, again, is why the work is so important in making sure that our work that we do is aligned with our values. So how did a kid from Jersey with a bachelor's degree in English, of all things, end up in each of those places? By always saying yes, by connecting the dots, and by making my own opportunities. In the spirit of thanks and in the spirit of giving away the glory, my friend Libby did the artwork that you see up here. You can visit her Etsy shop if you want to see more. Shop if you want to see more of what she did. Johnny's son was kind enough to give me permission to use his, um, his comic because, hey man, we've got this inflatable bouncy castle and are you going to take off your shoes or what? Thank you.